Okay, so this is my overview of episode two of Grotesquerie. It's entitled True Crime Catholics, which I absolutely love the title. Okay, so listen, episode two starts off with a flashback of the Courtney B. Vance as Marshall over at Lois's house. Okay, he's talking to Merritt about her health and tells Lois that she can weigh in whenever she's ready. But Lois says, baby, it's enough weight already. <laughs> Sorry, I that. <sighs> That was hilarious. Nisi, hilarious. So Marshall continues to lecture Merritt about her health. Merritt is over it and walks out. So he begins lecturing Lois about her drinking. And she calls him out about his sex addiction girl. Listen, I guess we all got problems, all right? Dad says he wishes he had her help in holding the family together. But baby, Lois says that that ship has sailed and to get the fuck out. Just reckless. <laughs> Lois is reckless. He says he still loves her sometimes, and she says that sometimes she anticipates a phone call informing her that he has died again. Baby Lois has had enough. Just a quick note we then see the record player start playing Otis Redding backwards. All right. We then get a quick shot of Lois at the hospital with Marshall, and of course, she's drinking. Nurse Sexy Red then approaches her, telling her to have some faith that Marsha will recover and to at least act like she cares. Lois is done listening and takes off her earrings, which in black woman means that she finna scrap. All right. Nurse Sexy Red does not want the smoke though and assures her that security is just down the hall. It kind of feels like Nurse Sexy Red is mocking Lois a little bit. All right. She sends Lois to the cafeteria to maybe get some coffee, which she does, and is strangely watched by a family in the cafeteria and decides to pop up on Nurse Sexy Red while she's in Marshall's room, seemingly stroking his meat. Baby, Lois asked what was going on. Sexy Red calls Lois a sicko for suspecting anything and Lois calls her a sexual predator. Nurse Red tells Lois that she can move his body to another hospital since she can't seem to control her psychotic behavior. She even calls Lois weak. Girl, I lied. Nurse Red does apparently want the smoke. She says that Lois doesn't know how to handle her current case nor her husband. So Lois tells her to go fuck off. Next scene is Lois. You guessed it, drinking at the table, going over the case. Merritt thinks the killer is taunting her mom. Lois thinks that the killer could be someone from the university who hates the Burnsides and chooses to investigate that path. Later, we see Lois arrive to the church where Sister Megan is working with her fellow nuns. She tells Sister Megan about the killer potentially being someone from the university and Sister Megan disagrees. I disagree too. It's way too easy, Lois. She says that the killer is well past the day-to-day -day functional life because that's what her gut tells her and says that Lois needs to listen to her own gut. She says that based on all the tabloids and photos that this killer is apparently preaching and has a God complex. She says to reach this monster, you must must reach the ecstatic. Later, we see Vespers begin, and of course, Sister Megan is in attendance. The priest, who she says knew the Burnsides, is played by Nicholas Chavez, who played Lau Mendez in the Menendez story on Netflix. He's obviously young and seems to be a down-to-earth priest who wears red cowboy boots, okay? He's giving sexy red also, all right? He talks about guns and how guns are fine, which... Okay? But he says that faith is as strong as a hollow point round? <laughs> what, what are you talking about, Mr. Priest? Okay, he seems to have a bond with Sister Megan the Stallion as he winks at her and they're having dinner in the next scene. Baby. <laughs> Sister Megan eats some fries across from the priest and says they taste orgasmic. And this is why I rock with Sister Megan the Stallion. Okay, she's determined to solve this Burnside case and the priest is excited that it's got their readership up. He says he's fascinated by true crime. They even speak on their favorite serial killers, which, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> they speak on the Burnside case and the priest suggests that the blood was drained from the bodies of the second crime scene as a way of capturing the victim's souls. Next scene is the priest wearing ass out chaps in bed as he jerks off. You know, they say the priests are the biggest freaks. He has scars all over his back. He then, you know, for his sinful masturbatory nature, begins quoting scripture to condemn his sins. Also, to condemn his sins, he begins whipping himself with a rope that has little barbed wires attached to it. That explains the scars, and this is just wild. 
Next scene is Sister Megan the Stallion working on a Catholic Guardian article. She calls Lois and suggests the murders are tied to Satanism. Lois says that they found blood on the sidewalk at the trap house crime scene and that it's tied to an organ harvester named Sullivan Fergus. In the 90s, Fergus would sell human organs on the black market. He was also a kidnapper, okay? Fer Fergus, he sounds sound dangerous, okay? Lois wants to help Sister Megan by giving her the details of this story in hopes of getting believers and non-believers back in the church. Lois and the SWAT team pulls up to Fergus's mother's home where he lives. Lois heads to the basement to find two what seems to be dead bodies, but the woman was actually asleep. Next scene takes place at a restaurant. Lois and Sister Megan meets up. Lois notices a small bruise on Sister Megan's face, but Sister says it's nothing and that she fell. Hmm. Lois turns down liquor from the waiter and now says that by doing so, it'll keep her sharp. Even though earlier in the episode, she told Merritt that liquor keeps her sharp. So uh, anyway, I'm not judging. She says that the blood found at the trap house was staged, apparently. Fergus had been dead for weeks. The woman was being carried out as she quotes a scripture from Psalm, which talks about how God can hate, which in the case of God is good hate. Mm. There was a note left at the scene that had a name that read grotesquerie on it. It also read, I belong to those who have troubled the sleep of the world. May all your dreams come true. Sister Megan recognizes that quote. She suggests looking into philosophy to help her solve the case and to perhaps utilize her ex-husband, who is a philosophy professor, but we know that isn't possible right now with Marshall's condition. Next scene is Lois driving in the rain. She comes to a stop and encounters the same homeless man from episode one. This time, she hands him a $20 bill. Lois was feeling generous, I guess. She gets home and shares with Merritt the box she found at the crime scene, asking her if she could open it, seeing that Merritt is good with puzzles. She's unable to open it, however. Mary goes to bed and Lois falls asleep in the chair. The record player subtly stops and wakes her up. She draws her gun. We see a male figure walk by in the background. She doesn't find anyone. Later, we see her praying at her bedside when she gets a call to come to yet another crime scene. This time, it's at a church. The victims are all homeless people positioned like Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper. It was pretty fucking sick. Lois recognizes the Jesus victim, who happened to be the homeless man she gave money to, which definitely says to me that this killer is watching her and the sister Megan suggested is fucking with her. Lois plans to leave this brutal crime scene to, you know, you guessed it, go home to drink. And bitch, honestly, <laughs> she deserves it. <laughs> This is my overview of episode two of Grotesquerie, True Crime Catholics. I absolutely love it. I loved it. I am fully invested. I can't wait for episode three.